as you follow the purpose and you get more connected to the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit does fill up your dream world more and more with witnesses. There's one point where Jesus just says, this world is nothing more than the call to witnesses. I thought, wow, that's an interesting definition of the world. Mm -hmm. Nothing more than the call to witnesses. So, in one sense, when you keep saying, I'm going to change my mind, I want to see things differently, I want to live this purpose, I want to devote my whole life to it, then Jesus is saying that the Spirit will populate the dream with the dream characters, and eventually there will be another step where you have to go beyond judging what he calls the, the witnesses of love and the witnesses of fear. Because until the mind really clicks in fully to forgiveness and sees they're all the same, that there really weren't witnesses in love and fear, when there's a split mind, ego and Holy Spirit, then you do see conflicting witnesses. And that's probably the hardest thing for everyone on their journey, is seeing conflicting witnesses. You have one week where you see so many witnesses and you just say, I'm, on the, I'm at the gates, the lawns of heaven. <laughs> I'm having the best week. I thank you for sending yeah. all these witnesses. And then the next week, something shows up and you go, I, I didn't choose hell. When did I, I didn't, uh, the weekend, I can't remember when I chose hell or, or fear because the witnesses seem to balance out and sometimes counteract each other until you just become so devoted and then the whole world starts to, to change. Like I always say, I was very shy and then I got into this and then I started traveling in purpose, you know, just going where I was invited and then staying with people like in this house, staying with them, staying on a couch or in a guest room. And then the more it went on year after year, then I went from having no friends, being shy, to having hundreds of very close, dear friends in many, many countries. But it took my willingness to just say, I give you my life, I give you everything to use for your purposes. And then the Spirit said, good, I'll bring witnesses then to this change of purpose. It made you more and the, the beginning time is the most difficult time because it's it's very hard for us to see mixed witnesses. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it seems insane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes the witnesses are so bright, and then other times the witnesses are so dark. Mm -hmm. And then you think, am I losing mm -hmm. my mind? What did I do right? What did I do wrong? You know, it, that's how it goes <clears throat> in the mind, and we we're not asked to really do that. It's like you were. Jesus said, you know, just take a step, walk right off that cliff. Don't worry, I'll catch you. Yeah. And you were just, you were just like, okay. <clears throat> yeah. That's, that's what it feels like. Yeah, and you took a big step, because I think I first met you in Portland. Wasn't it, or, no, it was, where was it? No, I, I think it was either, on, it was like Zoom or something. Zoom or something. <laughs> like, I've never seen you in person. Okay, before. good. I thought you remind me of somebody that I, I met in Portland, but it's, it's, it, it is like when you see the witnesses and you start to, to go in that direction, then the rest surely follow. And that's just a phase again. You know, it's not like we're, we're finished when we still see witnesses of love and fear. It just means we still have a split that's still in the unconscious mind. It hasn't been fully raised up. Lately, I mean, for the past month, I've been listening to a lot of NDEs on YouTube Me because too. I find it very inspiring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you see people that were lawyers, had a career, and then when they come back, they completely changed. So they become a new person because they step out of the box and then they don't want to fit in the box anymore. <laughs> and huh. so, lately, it's been very inspiring. Yeah, that's like a glimpse, you know. A glimpse can go a long way when you have a, a glimpse of something that transcends everything that you're used to, or transcends the familiar. And I think I've known a lot of people who have had big glimpses, but also then they, the, the, the main issue after the glimpse is um, they feel like they can't go back to the way thing, things were. And they want to somehow integrate. There's so many aspects to the glimpse. 
that that they're kind of like feeling still the afterglow of the glimpse, but the, how do I put this into everyday terms? And I think that's why it's so much about following your inner calling, finding your inner calling and, and following it, because that's where the day-to-day, moment-by-moment practice comes, where instead of just first deciding what to do and then doing it, Jesus does say in the Rules for Decision, he says, your one remaining problem is this. Whenever Jesus starts off a sentence with your one remaining problem is this, then you know whatever comes next is going to be really helpful. And he says, your one remaining problem is this. You first decide what you're going to do, and then you ask. Yep. Mm-hmm. It's this ego propensity. Mm-hmm. My life, my time on earth, my decisions to make, my day to spend however I want to spend my day. That's like the currency. Time is like a currency. Where ego is saying, here, I've invented time for you. Now you have a currency to use and spend it on what you personally want to do every day. And that's the baseline. That's how human beings operate. Even when we in a relationship, you know, what, do, what do you want to do today? What do you want to do today? <laughs> well, I want to do this. Well, I'm not interested in this, but I'll do this with you. Okay, I'll join you later this afternoon. That you know, I've got too many things to do that I want to do. And, and that I is personality, I is getting undone by through the prayer, just waking up and saying, okay, Holy Spirit, it's your day. What would you have me do today? You know, we mostly grew up with organizing skills and to-do lists. Most of us, we became good doers. And now the doer has to get undone. And the only way the doer can get undone is through guidance, intuitive guidance, where you get a strong guidance and maybe the ego even reacts to the guidance. Sometimes we get a real strong hit, like we're supposed to do something. I know for me, even before the course came, I was in university for 10 years, but I, I started getting these strong feelings. I was supposed to transfer out of one program to another. And then the ego kicked in. You can't do that. You can't do that. You're going you're gonna to upset your professors. You're going to upset your parents. You know, it just rallies the forces, even though the strong <coughs> guidance was to transfer uh, in, in university from one program to another. And and I just couldn't get that guidance to go away. I actually started making myself sick when I tried to rationalize and justify why I couldn't follow my intuition. And then I just got more and more sick until finally I said, okay, all right, I'll do it. And that was a big heart opening. And then very shortly after that, the Course in Miracles came into my life, months after that decision. And it was almost like, that was like a little test decision. Are you willing to follow this prompt? Because I've got a lot more <laughs> for you. Yeah. If you go against the grain mm-hmm. of your parents and professors and all the people telling you, you can't, you can't, you can't. And then I said yes, and then the course came, and then it was off you know, into a whole new trajectory mm-hmm. than what had been planned before. Yeah. That have that intention. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about guidance, I want to share a story, something that happened 25, 30 years ago. So anyway, I'm taking the, the interstate home. All of a sudden, I see this car, like, swerve. This guy, you know, gets off the road, and he's going one way, and I hear follow him. But I go up to this guy, and I said to him, do you need a ride into town? He's like, well, that would be great. He's like, can we bring my puppy Buster? I was like, oh my God. I just felt like that was like so God, like giving me that comfort with this little puppy, you know, that we put in the backseat of my car. But I talked to him about God the entire way. I mean, it was so, it was the most incredible thing I've ever experienced in my life. I was so high. I was so joyful. I was like, oh my God. I was like, I was floating. I mean, and that memory has come back to me. So my question is, 
where did that go? What, where, how did it disappear? What, I don't know what happened. You know, it's like, I want that back. I want that spontaneity back. That's a particularly good example at showing how there's this small, still voice that, that really wants to get our attention. Mm -hmm. There's even a workbook lesson where Jesus says, there's a child in you, and it's the Christ child, and he so wants to go home but give him a little quiet time. In other words, you have to nurture it. Your mind has to be quiet for this Christ child to go home. And, and a lot of people see it in terms of the guidance. Like that's how it started for me, little, little nudge like that. And then sometimes we surprise ourselves when we, we follow it. Yeah. That's the thing. You remember not yeah. only the feeling, but you followed it. Yeah. And then the puppy yeah. and everything about it, it was like, ooh, God got my attention there. Yeah. And, and I know progressively, I think that's why for me, it, after I was immersing and using the Course as an oracle, that's why Jesus took me traveling for five years, because he knew I was going to be out of my comfort zone and out of the familiar. When we have routines and rituals and we're boxed into a role, then it's easy to fall into the familiarity trap. You know, where we, we wake up and we don't pray, what should I do? We have a to-do list yeah. and we, we go through our routines over and over like robots, just over and over the routines and routines. So when I started traveling, I was taken to places I'd never been. I was using this Course of Miracles Miracle Distribution Center list of course groups and just popping in and having people invite me to their homes and come here and stay with me and all these things, which is like a whole explosion of things that were beyond my familiar. I went way out of the familiar really rapidly. It reminds me too of the time when I was in Oregon and I was driving around in this little gold three-cylinder car. It was a little tiny hatchback. And I had, I had my my clothes, I had some food and everything in it, and I'm driving along the highway, and I saw this person waving, 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 and I, I heard pull over. Mm -hmm. So I pulled over, it was a hitchhiker, so that it's me and the hitchhiker traveling. And then we're driving, maybe another 10, 15 minutes, another one waving, <laughs> I pull over, I pick up my second hitchhiker, mm -hmm. So it's this tiny little car, me driving, a hitchhiker in the passenger seat, and a hitchhiker behind him. So then, as I'm starting to pull onto the highway, there's an el elderly man, who, what it was, maybe about 60, 67, 70 years old, a rather large man. And he's, just as I'm, with these two hitchhikers in the car, with him, the tiny car, just as I'm pulling onto the entrance room, he's there, he's, He's going, pretty please, pretty me. The third hitchhiker. <laughs> and I'm like looking, because I've got some clothes behind me in the seat, and we've already got two in there, it's a tiny car. So I roll down, he's, please, pretty please. I said, you want, you want a hitchhike? Yes, but I need, I need a ride. So I said, I opened the door, and I pulled the thing so I could slide my seat up as far as I could. And I said, if you can get your body in the car, and we can close the car door, then you can ride with us. So he leaned in, hunched over the clothes that were behind me, and then his face was down here, because it was a, a bucket seat, and he's like, I'm in, let's go. So we went, all four hitchhikers, we went, I don't know, maybe 100 miles and everything, so I saw the sign. These hitchhikers had not bathed in, oh, no. I mean, Jesus was playing with me with the smell of the car was oh, under yeah. the <laughs> Finally, I thought it was like, it was saying showers, and I said, listen, it's a campground, I will spring for showers for everyone. <laughs> but, you know, it's stuff that when you're growing, I never picked up hitchhikers, but the more you got into this, the more like every day I would just leave the parameters wide open like, okay, let's, let's connect, let's inspire. And then one, two, three hitchhikers and myself squeezed in 
if somebody took a photograph, they would say, these, they're crazy happy because they don't look like they belong in the same car, but we did. And then it, I just kept going with it though, because those were a lot of things on the road that were so, I call them out of pattern experiences, there's nothing like them. And then the more they started to happen, I did pick up quite a few hitchhikers. I probably picked up 25, 30 different hitchhikers, had amazing talks with God about them. All, all four of us squeezed in there were actually talking about God. The whole talk was about our spiritual journey. You know, it was, I could see that Jesus had arranged and like, how many sardines can you get into a sardine can? You know, it's kind of the humor of that. But then we, we had so much fun and we talked about God and I thought, yeah, that's, this is the Holy Spirit. This must be the way the Holy Spirit works. And that, every little time I did something like that, it increased my trust. Mm -hmm. Until one day I went to one of these, it's kind of a similar thing to a, a Burning Man. Some of you have heard of Burning Man? Or, it was called Rainbow, Rainbow Festivals, and it was in northern Michigan. And I went up there and they had, a, they had tens of thousands of people. They had a Jesus soup kitchen, a Buddha soup kitchen, a Krishna. I mean, it was just this massive group of people. There were people running around naked. I felt like I was back in the 1960s or something. It was, which I had been as a child, but not as a grown. And I thought, this is like the 60s. And then it rained and it got hot and sweaty. And, and I would walk down a tunnel of people, of like tens of thousands of people. And as you walk through a little tunnel they make on the sloppy earth, muddy, I would walk along and you'd have all these faces and all the people looking into your eyes saying, welcome home, brother. All of them, like hundreds of them, welcome home, brother. And I'm like, what? This is surreal. <laughs> and then at some point, Jesus said, okay, you've had this experience. Now it's time to walk up this giant mud pile and go into the streets. It was in a, a, a national park. And there were rows and rows and rows of cars. That's where all the people parked. And I'm just walking along. At that point, I had probably picked up about 25 hitchhikers with the Holy Spirit's help. And I'm walking along in the middle of the night and I'm thinking, all right, Jesus, I got dropped off here and I have no car and I'm in the middle of the Northern Peninsula of Michigan, <laughs> walking in a some uh, like national forest out way, way out in the middle of nowhere. And I said, so I think I'm the one now that has to be the hitchhiker because <laughs> I have no car. And then I walked another like 50 feet and this guy was walking too and he said, are you leaving? And I said, yeah. And he said, you need a ride. <laughs> and I said, yeah. He drove me all the way down to Wisconsin. Wow. Uh, just scooped me up as soon as I felt like I was ready for my first opportunity to be the hitchhiker. Mm -hmm. Then like, within minutes. I was in the car. We were both driving all the way down to Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. I called my friend Kathy, who was at this peace house where I lived, and I said, she was my assistant, I said, I'm up in northern Wisconsin. I need a, a way to get back to Cincinnati. She said, I'll arrange, you know, whatever you need, a bus ticket or a plane flight and everything. But these are the kind of things that, they, it's almost like they have to steamroll, they have to build a momentum because they're so out of pattern that it's easy for the ego to dismiss them and go, boy, that was a fluke. Yeah. Boy, you got out alive. You weren't killed. <laughs> you know, that's, what, that's how the ego works. You know, well, you weren't killed at least. And it, instead of it being one, one little notch and one little step that leads to more. But now that you're remembering it now, I think that your mind is, that's a sign your mind is ready. Yeah, to me that, that's, that's actually how we build faith, because I do remember that part <clears throat> Jesus where, where he, you know, after he comes back in the resurrection, after he's, he's come back and he's talking to the apostles and he knows that Thomas is really the doubter, the doubting one of the apostles, and he has him come over, Thomas come over here and stick his, his finger in where the spike was and, and has him throw it put his uh, hand in the side where this, the spear came from the, the Roman soldier. And then he says, the interesting thing, he says, he says to Thomas, he said, 
Blessed are those who have seen and believed, like here. This is for the real doubters. Mm -hmm. Stick your hand in here, your finger in here, and stick your hand in here. Far greater blessed the, those that have not seen and believed. Because I really think Jesus is trying to teach us faith and trust. And he's trying to teach us faith and trust, which don't rely on our body's five senses. And he does say in the Course, the body's eyes were made not to see, and the body's ears were made not to hear. So it gives you an idea that the ego has made the body as part of its trap, to trap the mind into a false identity. And then, he's talking about faith, because I think every time I had one of those miracle experiences, my faith somehow grew, I, I can trust this. Even though all the evidence from the past tells me I can't, and even though my five senses are saying, you can't be serious, you're going to, now you're going to be turned into Mr. Intuitive? Mm -hmm. What, Mr. Analytical in 10 years of university, and now you're going to be Mr. Intuitive? You know, and that's exactly what, where it's heading. It's saying, no, we all have an intuitive voice. We all have those little prompts and nudges, but it takes, following them, and then having an experience that grows the faith. Then we do it again. And before you know it, we start doing it so much that we actually expect a miracle. Like I actually hiked all the way up that mud, got there, was walking along, and I just was kind of laughing, <laughs> just thinking, here I am walking in the middle of the woods in Michigan and far away from everything else. And I was kind of laughing and I sounded like joking with Jesus, like, well, now it's about time I need to be the yeah. offered a ride, and then, and it was like, oh, of course, you know, again, like that even built the faith <laughs> one more step, you know, like, of course, of course, it's, it's handled, it's taken care of, yeah, that's it. I'd like to ask a question for you, David, yes. about um, something I heard earlier during the video, you were talking about cause and effect, and also, of course, our thoughts creating our reality, but I thought I heard you say there really isn't cause and effect, and I was wondering, well, why aren't our thoughts causing our reality? How are you? Well, I've, I've given a lot of talks, but basically, the whole realization of opening to God is to realizing that, that God is the cause, and Christ is the effect, and they're both so it's a spiritual cause-effect relationship between creator and creation. Now, when we look at the world, what Jesus says is the ego is the belief that cause and effect can be split off, meaning that the Son or the Christ can leave God. That's the split off part. And turned around. So that things in the world seem to determine our state of mind. What happens to our body, we would say, without our trained mind, we would say, what happens to the body, you know, uh, I have a migraine headache, this migraine is killing me. Uh, this migraine is driving me crazy. Or I have a, a sore toe and a, hang, a, a toenail and this, my feet are killing me. Uh, you know, that's literally how cause and effect are described. And it's also how children interact, like siblings will say, you make me mad, mom. They hurt my feelings. They did this to me. You know, when the kids come running in, it, it's all, they're just spewing off. This was done against me, and this is the cause of how I feel. And then the Course is basically saying mind over matter. It's basically saying, no, everything you experience is the result of your thoughts. And it's true that, that our ego thoughts produce a projection of an ego world. So, but what Jesus is saying is, the ego is not a real cause, because God didn't create it. So it's a false cause producing false effects. And then the human being tries to tinker with the false effects, you know. I'm going to find the right job, the right person to live with, I'm going to buy the right clothes, I'm going to have the, be in the right climate, you know, it, it goes through, I'm going to control the effects to live a happy life. And it doesn't work that way. It's it's our thoughts that that bring about our emotions. Mm -hmm. And our right-minded thoughts come from God. They bring about happiness, joy, peace. And the wrong-minded thoughts 
bring forth witnesses, crazy, crazy witnesses, you know, where we were left like, oh, this is, this is not good. I, you know, some people say, I need to get out of here. <laughs> this is a, this is a hellish nightmare at times. And at other times, the mind is convinced that it's good thoughts and its preferences, when they start to be witnesses, then that even makes it more like a double blind because you're, you're not only convinced that the, that the dark things are real, but you're also convinced that the positive things are real. And then people get into positive thinking trying to ignore the, the negative and the judgments. And the hope is, is that if I have enough positive thoughts, they'll just drown out the negative thoughts, but the negative thoughts run super deep. They're, they're unconscious. Most of them are unconscious. So that's what I was saying, you know, that I studied so many different disciplines in 10 years of university, but, but at some point with the Course in Miracles, Jesus taught me, he said, no, all the, the, the things that you studied, all the schools of thought and the the subjects that you study in university and high school and so forth, they're all based on false cause-effect relationships. He calls them spurious cause-effect. Even physics, for every action there's a reaction, uh, down to chemistry, down to baking a cherry pie. You know, that, that's, that involves spurious cause-effect relationships involving heat, dough, dough rising, crust, you know, and pulling it, pulling the pie out before it turns black. You know, it's everything. Even baking a cherry pie is Jesus is like, no, no, that's spurious cause-effect relationship. So everything your five senses witnesses are witness are part of this devious, ingenious plan to keep you from knowing that you're the Christ, keep you from knowing your spiritual reality. Thank you for expanding on that. It really it caused a ripple in my um, in my previous trainings in yoga. And the guru telling me oh, every cause has an effect. This is part of the karmic understanding. So, can you relate that in any way to understanding of, of karma, or is that something that's non-existent in this? Yeah, karma. Philosophy? Karma just seems to be karma because. What Jesus says is, <laughs> this has got to be the old time zinger of a line, history would not exist if you didn't keep making the same mistake in the present. Mm -hmm. oh, 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 wow. That's like a, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> history would not exist if you didn't keep making the same mistake in the present. In other words, what karma is, is just the repetition of an error. But the error, the error is never in the past. It's only covering over the present moment with the error that generates a seeming future. So the whole thing with karma is, like karma is saying, well, what you did in a past life or what you did in the past is going to have future consequences. And what Jesus is saying is, if you believe in the ego, you will keep generating an illusion of time in which the error seems to loop, like Groundhog Day. Yes. You know, where he keeps stepping in the same puddle. Yeah. And he does it over and over. Every day he steps in the same puddle until one day he sees the puddle and his foot goes out. But remember how Bill Murray, you know, he kind of balances his foot and then he kind of happily hops over it. That's kind of foreshadowing that he's going to escape. He's going to get out of the loop. Mm. And he does. By the end of the movie with Rita, you know, he gets out of the loop and it's a whole, he, it's a whole new day. It's all life. The snow too. It's all very bright. So yeah, there's, it, we have a thing called Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. And we probably have at least 20 or 25 mm. time movies, looping time, repeaters, uh, <laughs> What, I can't even think of them all. There's so many. About time. About time. <laughs> There's probably at least 25 time Before movies. Before I in. fall is my favorite. Before I fall. Yeah, that's the best one. The yeah. Time Keeper's Wife. The yeah. Time Traveler's Wife. Time, time Traveler's Wife. Somewhere in time. Look Somewhere work. in time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just... And they're all very helpful because when you watch them, then there's something inside of you that kind of lights up. Like, oh, yeah. 
this is a trick. So it's, in the ultimate sense, um, like the Bible says, as you sow, so shall you reap. But what Jesus is doing is he's saying, I need you to come back to realize that, that the unholy instant when you seem to fall asleep mm. has been replaced now by the holy instant. And so in that sense, karma is not real, in the sense that, it, that it's already been corrected. It's, it makes it sound like somehow, well, I already, I'm paying the price now for what I did in previous lives. And Jesus is saying, no, no, it's actually, you still are, are making the mistake, you're still choosing to repeat the past. Hmm. You're chill, still using this moment to repeat something that's already over and done. And he was just the first one to realize that the whole thing was over and done. That's why he kept talking about God's love and love, 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 love. So, Everything was about love. So Jesus was created when we were created and had been going through the loop himself until that point. He seemed to, like from a reincarnation perspective, he seemed to come to a point where he... Okay. He recognized the clues and he, he chose the way out. Oh, okay. And that's why he's the way, the truth, and the light. Because right. he was just the first right. one to, to, to choose. Reach. Right. And it wasn't like he, there was actually a real he back then, because that was a body. He's, he's like saying, the loop isn't real and I'm with you right now. And that's why we have all these gatherings and everything to train our mind. Uh -huh. One time I was down in... Uh, Mexico City, this is the way it goes. I hop into a van with five other people. We take a road trip to do a, a, a retreat down in uh, south of Mexico City. We drive down to Mexico City. It's the first time I've been in a vehicle in Mexico City, which is the largest city in uh, Mexico. We get down there and the traffic is such that we find ourselves somehow caught in a traffic loop. We keep looping and coming back, and then we loop again. And then we loop again. And then we loop again. And we're all just looking and going, what's going on here? We're, we're in the loop. This is like Star Trek episode or Groundhog Day. We're, we're in there. And so we had, I said, I remember this Star Trek episode where the ship kept going through this same time loop. And at the end of the loop, the ship would blow up. Mm -hmm. And then it would start again in the loop, and then the ship would blow up. So the ship was repeatedly looping, and everybody blew up. So finally they went they, to the android, Data, and they said, ah, oh, he's the android. Maybe he can find the clues. Notice the clues. And they went for one more loop, and then he saw the clues, but they blew up. Mm -hmm. So then he came around, and and they to help them not blow up. So I was telling this to the people in the van with me because we're caught in a loop in Mexico City. And I said, so we have to, we don't know how we're looping, we don't know how we got in it, except we drove into it, but now we can't get out of it. And we're never going to get to our retreat center if we <laughs> looping in Mexico City. So I said, let's all pay close attention so we loop all the way around, we come all the way around to the beginning, and we see this woman who's got an official hat on, and, and we roll down the windows and we said, Ma'am, please help us! <laughs> uh, she was like some uh, official person. Uh, Ma'am, please help us, we're caught in a loop, a traffic loop. And she laughed and laughed and laughed. <laughs> Apparently, this happens to people all the time. Yeah. <laughs> in Mexico City. She's there's... the loop keeper. Yeah, she's the loop keeper. <laughs> and we're like, we're like, what? How do we get out of the loop? And she said, look back. And we said, what is it? She said, back there, you're already past them. But there's these guys, and they wear blue shirts. There's guys in blue shirts. We're like, what? They said, she, she said, can you see them? Like, yeah, there they are back there. We've already passed them. She said, now go back nice. in the loop. <laughs> and the next time you come around, stop and ask those guys in the blue shirts if you can buy a ticket uh, <laughs> to take this exit. Did you? We couldn't, we couldn't get in there. It was like a cold <laughs> thing. Oh my God. 
we, we were like, and then you got your blue vest on, just like that. We were like, we were like, what? So we went around and we we're like, Ugh. there they are, they're blue. <laughs> we pull over. We said, can we buy a ticket? They said, oh my God. Oh yes. Cool. And so they sold us. Now that's just, you know the Holy Spirit is heaven so fine, because that ties into the whole thing of karma and time. Like, when you're in a loop, but you don't know it's a loop, and you just see the same people every day, and the same things repeating, and you don't understand why this is happening. You don't know where it started, you don't know how it's going to end, you don't know the way out. But, but that lesson was pay close attention, because we, if we hadn't seen that lady with the cap, we would never know about the people with the blue shirts, and we would have just been you know, still be there. Yeah, still be there. Today. Yeah. David Bowie, I, I, I was going to ask this question before when you were talking about witness, the witness conversation. That um, I remember it, when I was a kid in church, there was this line. You probably know the whole line where it was something about bearing false witness, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that's the trick is we, we don't want to bear false witness, yes. we want to bear true witness. That's, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. it seems like that's, that's the way, I mean, from a quantum perspective, if, if you, if you think that it's, time is actually all happening at the same time, so it's more than parallel universes, it's, it's more than than uh, Mark Zuckerberg's multi-universe. It's, it's mm -hmm. simultaneous universe is what we've got going on. So every, there aren't really past lifetimes or future lifetimes. That's still within the linear construct, but it's, that's, that's like an old metaphor now. We, we, have to go, we have to go quantum, just like Einstein. I'm going to show the movie on the 31st. I'm going to show Einstein and Edison, and I'm going to go way into quantum physics and how quantum physics relates to the course. Because quantum physics is basically saying there's, there's a quantum field where everything is connected. It's just pure energy. And that's like the happy dream that Jesus talks about in his book. The quantum field for the quantum physicist is the happy dream. Because everything's completely connected. But there's no time in the quantum field either. And so all, like Deepak Chopra, you know, unlimited potential, pure potentiality, you know, it's, you start to see that the quantum field is more like Deepak, pure potentiality, you know. However, what you choose out of the potentials is based on your past beliefs. So the only way to, to realize that you're, you are one with the pure potentiality, you are one in pure spirit, pure unified awareness, is to clear away all the, the beliefs of time and space, which is what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is just sees the false as false. It's not inside the cosmos. It's actually beyond the cosmos. So it's the dreamer. The, the quant quantum physics applies to the physical world. Yeah. And which is something that's been one thing, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Duh, you know, but, uh, some, just, I guess, related to that, it's something that's almost like trying to explode out of me. Uh, it related to what I'd mentioned earlier. And there's nothing <clears throat> about us having come from some other place by some other means, by land, air, or sea, whatever. We are all still in the one spot we started with in the creation. So, when I get in my car and I start driving off as it appears that I'm doing, and everyone else gets into a car and goes to the airport or whatever, uh, none of that is happening outside of the illusion. We're just an illusion, and we are all in this, in heaven, in this place that we started with originally, we are not going anywhere. And that's, that's starting to, that was part of that thing I had this morning. It was just for a very, just momentarily feeling every one of us together. I was coming in trying to generate some, some verse to 
bring that together and I know the Holy Spirit gave it to me. So you are together, you know, and I just, yeah, so, yeah. oh wow, I just like, ugh, I just felt everybody. So we are not going anywhere when we get up to leave here in the body. Right. <laughs> it's almost like this is a loop. Like we've all done this before many times. I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> and, and it's like this is a quantum moment where we've yeah. all been yeah. here before. That's what the deja vu. Sometimes when you mm-hmm. feel like you look around, you go, "Yeah, I swear I've been here." And Jesus, mm-hmm. well, Ken Wapnick, who is the first teacher of the course, he said. All of time and space is deja vu. <laughs> it's, it's, one, it's one deja vu moment in which it seems to take all these different configurations and that we've all really been here before, but the forms were different. But there's something so familiar, like that feeling you had, like, I love you all. Oh, I, man, this I'll is my it. first course of air yeah. right? And I'm in I love with all of you. Feel it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You took that ride to come. But, but I think ultimately then it comes down to, there's a song that I play sometimes, it's called Don't Decide. And it's a beautiful song. Don't decide, make no choices and you'll finally get it right. Because there's actually a part in the Course where Jesus says that eventually you learn to decide not to decide. Mm-hmm. You know, we've been addicted to choice. Mm-hmm. And then there's some kind of escape clause mm-hmm. where we actually realize we don't need to do anything at all. <laughs> it's, the, it's the rest. You know, we finally just rest and realize, I don't have to find my way out of this. I need to, I need to completely rest and pause, and I need to not decide. Whereas before, I had all this guilt about making the wrong decisions. All of us have rehashed. I could have done this differently, and I wish I had done this, and I wish I could redo, like that movie About Time, wish I could redo, and then finally he gives up on the redo, and he just accepts all things exactly as they are, and he's just so happy his, with his wife and children, and his, everybody is so happy when he just surrenders this idea that I have to make something right, that I've done something wrong and I have to make right. That's the happy dream. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yogi Berra was right. He said deja vu all over again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's it. deja vu. He always had these spiritual zingers <laughs> he did. coming out. Yeah. Maybe he read A Course in Miracles. Yeah. I, I, I'm tired of the, doing the same thing again and over again, but worse is always wanting to relive, go back to, I wish I could go back to this year and do it right and do it again and avoid all the mistakes Mm -hmm. that I felt caused pain or were wrong or that I regret. And and talking to Cindy the other day, I I said, just this morning, I just realized I can go back in time to right now Mm -hmm. and do it right right now. I don't have to go back 10 years to redo that. I'm here. I can redo it right now, today. Yeah. That's very long. That's all I'm doing now. That's it. I think that's what Leaky was asking, well, isn't that we talked? Mm-hmm. And she said, all these divorces here, could you give me and my husband a blessing? <laughs> he said, how's that? How's that for the request? I'm here for a blessing. <laughs> I need a blessing. Yes, I said, yes. We bless you, you and your husband. <laughs> we bless your mind. <laughs> yes. Yes, we bless your mind. Well, I did write a book many years ago called Purpose is the Only Choice, because when I really went into prayer, Jesus was saying that ultimately your question should be, what is it for? When you look at the fragmented world and you try to react to the pieces of what you think you should do or you ought to do, then you're you're caught in the past. And then the the whole thing just keeps spinning. But if you actually honestly say to yourself, what is it for? Like, what is the purpose of this world for me now? That is the the saving grace. And he says the answer is forgiveness. You're just here 
to, to see that it's already been corrected. You don't have to personally try to find your way out. Because that's where the struggle, that's where the karma, the, the loop comes in. When we think, I, little I, personality I, have got to figure out a way. And he says in the Course, he said, each one tries to solve the riddle of himself. It's like we're trying to do a Rubik's Cube with our identity. We keep trying to turn it and turn it and change it, waiting for it to come, come round right. Like the Quaker song, wasn't it? We turning and turning till it comes round right. Or the Enya did a song. Anybody remember Enya's song, Anywhere Is? I might be this, I might be that. It's neither this nor that way, it's one way or the other. It should be on reflection, it could be. And then the song ends with the turn that I am making, the turn that I am taking, I might be just beginning, I might be near the end. You know, it's a total <laughs> kind of a undoing of the idea of beginning and end and, and trying to find your perspective in the middle of it. Just like saying, maybe you should just give up, mm -hmm. um, give up the, the trying. And to me, that's, that has been purpose, because I think as soon as I felt like I had my life's calling and my purpose, then I took off into that. Just expecting miracles, just expecting everything to show up every day that I would need. Not trying to plan my future, not trying to determine, figure out what the spiritual journey was. Like that woman who asked me the question, you know, where she said, I don't understand. The script is written. I don't understand the miracle. And I, I joined her. I said, yeah, we can't. We can't understand first and then hope to experience. We have to have an experience. And then in the experience, we understand, finally. Uh -huh. But it's not like our book learning. Our book learning always says, read, study, before you have a family, understand what you're getting yourself into. Before you have a career, you better understand what you're doing. But nobody's going to pay you. You see, we believe the understanding had to come first, but that was like intellectual understanding. And now we're finding intellectual understanding is an oxymoron. There, the intellect cannot understand. It was made to not understand. <clears throat> But you so, begin with that, right? You begin with the intellectual. You can start there, but you can start. But in the end, you know, that's why Jesus said, be as little children. You know, they, mm -hmm. they really aren't highly evolved. I mean, you have to have a certain mm -hmm. intellect to be able to read that Shakespearean uh, iambic pentameter text. Well, it's and a pathway, determine... but actually I think, I think there are many pathways to God and and Intellectual understanding, you have to remember, is just one form, like Helen Schuckman was described. She did remark, she said, at last, a pathway to God for intellectuals. So that's, that's why it's a big book. But it wasn't saying that that was the only way. In fact, I think it's probably more difficult no. to try to learn the world and then try to go and unlearn everything that you learned about the world, instead of just being like a flower mystic. <laughs> or being like St. Francis, you know. He goes to war, he realizes this ain't it. <laughs> he comes back, he's in a fever. Mm -hmm. He comes out of the fever and then he goes, and he's with butterflies and, mm -hmm. and he's with the birds and the plants. And he's, he's in a higher state of mind than he ever was. Mm -hmm. Not through intellectual understanding, but this he through- of course, Yeah. Yeah, he didn't need the Course in Miracles, he, he was there. Even people now who go to Assisi, they, to the church where he was, they just feel this huge energy. Wayne Dyer felt it when he went over and took a trip there. Like this huge energy and it's just the essence of St. Francis. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's right there. <laughs> Did you uh, ever meet Helen Strachan? Um And or are there any really favorite stories that you know about Bill Thetford, Ken Wafnick, or Helen? Just all time zinger stories that you can share. Well, there's lots of them, but I never did personally meet um, Bill or Helen, but I, Ken and I were good friends, so we spent quite a bit of time together, and there was a lot of very fun things that happened there, and then he was telling me all stories. Also, Judy Sketch, 
who was one of the original four, uh, yeah. she kept inviting me to her house over and over and over. Uh, and when I would go for lunch or dinner, we would spend four or five, six hours. And she was just like an oracle. She would just go one story after the next, after the next. And they were the most kind of amazing kind of stories. Mm -hmm. One time she told me she was in, um, she was in New York City and she was kind of like the one that always had the house where they all hung out. They all would come to her house. But one time, um, they found out there was a, a world-renowned psychic. And so Judy said that she and Ken and, and Helen and Bill all went to see this world-renowned psychic. And she said they all sat there, <clears throat> and the psychic kind of went into a trance and closed his eyes, and they didn't know what to expect. But suddenly um, the psychic pointed to Helen and said, you, for many, many lifetimes, were his student. And she pointed over to Bill. She, this was the psychic was going way back into the Akashic records and time and said, no, yes, you were a student and he helped you develop your ability so that you could deliver this course. Well, Judy said, at that point, Bill just burst into tears because in Bill's perception, he was like the third wheel. He was the one who just comforted her and, and typed, and he was just like an accessory. Mm -hmm. Helen was the great one with the great mm -hmm. skill and everything, and, and he didn't have the perspective of the psychic saying, no, you, you collaborated and were together many, many lifetimes to help her, guide her to be able to use her skill. And in this lifetime, you're there again doing it for her. And he had such unworthiness of feeling that he wasn't deserving of, of anything and, and he just burst into tears. So these are the kind of stories that, that Judy would tell me, all the nuances, even the times when uh, Helen and Bill, they went to see uh, Catherine Kuhlman, who was a very famous um, Christian healer. And here are these two research psychologists that go into this auditorium with Catherine Kuhlman and they're just like, Feel the energy, Bill. I'm like, yeah. I don't know what this is. Woo! <laughs> you know, it was all this Christian healing sort of energy, and they're research psychologists, so they were like kids in the candy store. Like, ooh. they went down to see um, to Edgar Casey's, uh, to meet Hugh Lynn Casey. You know, a famous psychic, his son. So I got to hear kind of firsthand many, 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 many stories, and and even about healings. One time, uh, Judy, uh, she burned her hand in the kitchen and then uh, Bill came over and just prayed and joined with her and the whole, the whole burn went away. But yeah, you get more of a context of, through all their uh, parables about how this is way beyond what seems to be what we call a current lifetime. That there are these healing patterns and this huge willingness over many, many, many lifetimes. And what we just see is a small little sliver of perception that, that we think is so important. And, and it's not really important at all. It's like an entire lifetime in a human span is, one time Jesus was flying with Helen and they were flying along and Helen almost, they were flying over her lifetime as Helen Shuckman and she almost missed her entire lifetime. And then Jesus swung back around and said, oh, there you are, there's your lifetime right there, the lifetime of Helen Shuckman. And she was like, it's so insignificant, I could have, <laughs> could have easily missed that, <laughs> point that out. Like, what, on, we think of a lifetime as a big, long, traumatic, emotional thing, and it's tiniest little, tiny little glitch in the span of time that, that has no significance whatsoever. And yet we strive so hard, you know, with survival of the body and the prestige and the recognition and all the things we accomplish, we think we accomplish. It's all, Shakespeare said it right, much ado about nothing. You know, we would laugh if we really saw how insignificant the things of time are. We would just 
we would have such a belly lift, we would not stop laughing. But to think that I was upset about about that. <laughs> That's why I always say the angels are laughing. You know, the angels are always just laughing and laughing. Yeah.